However, uh, before we get started, I have one more set of books to give away. Um, and uh, one more thanks. Uh, is anybody from Master Clock still here? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Um, our time this year was done by Master Clock, and uh, Master Clock's clocks are absolutely amazing. This crew, croup, group, crew, croup. We're going to call them this croup. Um, these these clocks keep accurate precision. Precision. In fact, I think I was mentioning to someone yesterday. They, the gentleman who uh, runs the company, they figured out with NIST that the time was point zero 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 one off, which is a concept I can't even grasp. So, uh, big thanks to Master Clock to make sure that we all knew that we were running late, and in some cases of you know Michael that he was actually early. All right, uh, David Seibuck. Uh, had a couple books he wanted to go ahead and give away. Uh, Black Hat Python and Python Crash Course. And I am going to give this to someone that was born in 1995. Raise your hand if you were born in 1995. One person born in 1995. John, you were born in 1895, not 1995. Raise your hand if you were born in 1995. Well, come on up, and guess where you're from, Master Clock. I'm going to go ahead and just, I said I was going to make someone very, very rich here. I'll go ahead and give you back your, uh, your prize as well. Since Richard's giving away, uh, you know, Bitcoin, I'll give you cash. Congratulations. All right, for our final talk of the conference, um, I would like to welcome uh, Richard um, Dogan. Dennis. Dennis. Richard Dennis. I'm sorry, sir. Um, Richard is uh, from Netitude. Uh, he obtained his master's in computer science information security with a grade of distinction from the University of Portsmouth in 2013 and is currently at the writing stage of his PhD, examining scalability solutions to blockchain networks. Good luck with that. Uh, Richard taught as a lecturer on cryptography at the School of Computing at Portsmouth University from 2017, being the youngest cryptographer lecturer in the United Kingdom. I'm pretty sure it's most places in the world. Uh, currently, Richard is undertaking research with Netitude on vulnerabilities with uh, PKI, uh, key generation and cryptocurrencies, as well as looking at use cases of blockchain technology. Everybody give a wonderful welcome to Richard. Right, cheers, guys. Um, so yeah, the talk today is just about uh, public-private key cryptography. Um, and we've just found, like I say, this is just going on now about um, the key generations protocols within uh, Bitcoin. So um, we do the attack on Bitcoin, but we also then further did this attack against other cryptocurrencies, especially with the ICO market the way it is. Um, we, this applies to a lot more than just uh, Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is the, most, uh, bigger, the biggest and the most notorious, so we went for Bitcoin. So, uh, so this is just a bit of background for me. Um, I'm CTO of a Dra uh, Dragon Infosec. We do uh, blockchain technology. We just about to launch an ICO. Now uh, we've done pre-ICO on this, and this will be a hundred million ICO. Um, in the other, like I say, my other role then is a senior researcher in Netitude, and I'm also a lecturer in cryptography. Um, so yeah, like I say, this is just uh, some background on me. The, uh, like I say, master's degree there was done with the Tor Anonymity Network. So we found a way here of de-anonymizing door hidden services. Uh, we interacted with this as well without actually needing a Tor protocol. So that was quite a cool, um, quite a cool project. And now since then, we've just been studying for the last five years on blockchain. Uh, as you see, my research areas here are mostly cryptography. Um, we look at anonymity networks, peer to peer, just general things. So this talk, I say, is well, it won't be an hour. It'll be about forty minutes, but. Um, it's quite a good one. So first things first, I'll just go through a high level understanding here of public private key cryptography for you guys that are not familiar with it. Uh, sorry, but this does get very technical very quickly. But um, like I say, we'll go through the security risks then of crypto. Um, we'll explain, for example, why this is bad, how you can prevent it, that sort of thing. 
and then we go through three attacks. So we got three attacks in this pro in this slide. We just made it right. So the key one, for, for example, first is the public-private key attack, how to find private keys based on public keys, something you should never, ever be able to do. Um, we then look at the Nano Ledger S wallet. This is a hardware wallet, uh, and this should be completely secure against this attack. But we've, we show two methods on which we can get generate keys as well from this. And there's also a third attack in this as well, which I, de uh, which I basically controlled the entire Bitcoin network with 30 nodes. Um, considering there's 12,000 nodes and it should be um, all the same, um, it was quite a cool attack. And all of the research we've done here, though, has since been presented to the relevant uh, developers and everything, and good to say that most of these things are patched. There's one or two that are not patched, but you'll see why in a bit. That's mostly user error. It's not, um, it won't be down to um, deployment, if you like. So when we go back to public-private key, this comes from uh, the British. They claim uh, GCHQ in the 70s, so this is our version of the NSA. Um, they claim to be the first um, for this, but we don't know because of what they do. Um, I say SSL, TSL, possibly one of the most common types of this crypto, uh, and then it provides authentication and encryption, so you know who you're talking to. You can guarantee that who you're talking to is the right person, assuming obviously they have had their keys um, stolen, and then we've also got encryption as well, so obvious things are this. So there's two parts, public put keys, they are pretty much public, is what they say. So these keys now everybody knows. They know, every, everybody knows who's got this key. This public key, I basically says, look, this is my key, and I give it out to everybody. But only I hold the private key. So the private key is always held by me. Now the key thing here is, while everybody should have the public key, they should never ever be able to generate the private key based on the public key. So no matter how much information I give you, the public key, the private key here should not be uh, relatable to the public key at all. So you should never ever be able to work backwards. It's a very expensive uh, problem, and it should never actually be able to then work backwards. And then, like I say, you've got authentication as well. So if, for example, I sign a message with this private key, everybody on the network can see that it is indeed from me, and this message is from me. So you don't need to know my private key to read my messages. You also don't need to know my private key as well to send me a message. So you can encrypt it with my public key, send it to me, and only I can read that uh, message in. So it's really got, this is quite a cool way of crypto. And like I say, a lot of the internet infrastructure and modern cryptography is based on this. So I'm just going to go through some brief things. Like I say, the main uh, security of this is you should never ever be able to generate the private key based on the public key. So no matter how much computer computational effort required, it should never ever be able to do it. So the security as well on this relies on not just this, but also you've got to keep your, public key, your private key sorry, private. So obvious reasons, if I give out my private key to everybody, then everybody else can impersonate me. So this is one of the key issues at the moment facing Bitcoin. I'm sure you've read about all the exchanges that's recently been hacked, two, three hundred million going missing on a regular basis, on a daily basis, or some, it feels like. Um, all of these attacks have come from people getting the private keys. So breaking into servers, finding vulnerabilities into the servers, into the network to retrieve these private keys. That's a lot of work. Um, we show in this way you can generate the, pub the private key based on the public key. But um, this basically is the key things of public-private key. And here's just a nice diagram here just to show you what I basically mean by public-private key. So as you see, I've got a police plain text. I encrypt it with who I want to send it to, the public key. Um, this then encrypts into a ciphertext, obviously, how it encrypts it is down to any protocol you like. Um, but the key thing here is only that user at the end of it can decrypt the, uh, the, pub the, the ciphertext here. So no matter who intercepts this on the network, only the person with the corresponding private key should be able to um, decrypt it. So one of my favorite, um, this is just personal preference, this is, or is just Diffie-Hellman. This is a algorithm back to the six, uh, about the 70s, 80s, one of the early algorithms anyway. Um, what Diffie-Hellman doesn't do is encrypt. You, this just generates public-private keys. Uh, to encrypt, you need to use another algorithm, for example, Algamal, but this is a secure way of sending um, two um, keys uh, through the across the network. So I know your public key and you know my private key. Yeah, I know your public key and you know my I, I know my private key technically. So the key thing here is, and uh, this is the same for a lot of um, 
public private key crypto is everybody will know the private the public key but nobody ever will know the, the, the private key so the public key is given to everybody uh, and me and you me and a person so alice and bob can communicate with each other and by sending no data across the network though we will be able to generate a pair of matching keys uh, this is a very good uh, thing because, for example, if we're sending over secrets across the network, if the network is compromised for whatever reason, then you, they'll be able to generate um, the corresponding key. So what this basically means, and this is why I like Diffie Helmer so much, is me, for example, Alice and Bob can communicate together. They can generate keys in such a way which they can both um, encrypt and decrypt messages without knowing each other's secrets. So that's the, uh, the small a there. Uh, and I say it's just using modular. So it's just using basic mathematics, very basic modular mathematics. And um, yeah, it's just a secure way of sending stuff across the network. One problem with this, though, is it's very expensive. So you've got to do this now every single time you want to send a message. So you can't rely on doing this once and then putting it into Algamal's encryption system, for example, and then sending the messages because you are then opening yourself up to attack. What we do here is you, we say now you have to you have to create a public private key every time you send a message. Now that's very expensive, and that's not unlike what Bitcoin's requiring you. So with Bitcoin, every time you send a uh, send a transaction, it's recommended you send it to a completely different wallet, so a new address um, that you never used before. Uh, this, of course, then needs a key pair, a public private key key pair, and that's expensive to do. So the way to people now are looking into ways now of reducing. Uh, public private uh, public private key key generation. The, it's very expensive. For example, on a standard i7, it takes around three four seconds for a good key pair to be generated. So that's a lot. If you're running a server farm, um, it's a lot. So this is one of the reasons why I'll talk about in a bit about why this attack works. So I've gone a little bit off topic, but the maths involved in this, for example, if you like I say, if you had a very very powerful supercomputer, supercomputer that cannot possibly exist. Uh, and you went through, for example, a standard 256 uh, key byte, uh, byte key space, uh, you basically run out of time before the end of the universe to um, do this. So we go through the laws of thermodynamics, for example, and right now 256 can never be cracked, theoretically, without a boot, with a brute force. And this is assuming though you calculate every single possible combination until you get one. Obviously, you might do this on the first go, but that's very unlikely. If you go, you, you, we expected to do it in half this time with uh, good odds, but basically we run out of time before the end of the universe, before this is done. And we haven't got the energy to do this, we haven't got the computing power, this is actually impossible. But that's a lot to brute force uh, yeah, brute force keys. Um, the attack I'll show you in a minute will take, what, two, three seconds uh, to go backwards. Now, this attack doesn't happen on all Bitcoin uh, wallets, so I've got to say this doesn't happen to every single one. But there are a couple of thousand of them which this is vulnerable to. And up until recently, I've we done this attack actually in the last few weeks. And there are still ways, there's still actually wallets, etc., that are using very similar systems to this which are vulnerable. So, like I say, now public private key, this is the public private key crypto used by Bitcoin. They use elliptical curve algorithm, which is very good. It's now being defined as a standard. It never used to be used that much before Bitcoin, and now it's really coming to its own. It's quite popular now as well. Um, it's used because once it's optimized, it's very quick. Um, it's very efficient, like I say, efficient computation, and it's around 30% faster than other uh, implementations, if you like. But like I say, this is now, so this is quick. It's not the best algorithm, but it's mathematically secure. So you really, when you get to this sort of level of algorithm, you're really now going down to very fine how much data is it, how much data is transmitted, how much data you store, um, this sort of thing. So like I say these are they, they basically as well. The one key thing as well, this is why most people have started adopting two five six is especially with the RSA hack, uh, well, attack basically the NSA did, where they basically backdoored uh, crypto. Um, for $15 million, I think it was, that's all. Um, this by here shows you, it, you should be able to detect, for example, if there's a backdoor in the system. Um, what the attack with RSA is, I don't know if you know about this, this is through the Snowden leaks. Um, the NSA paid $15 million to RSA, so they can predict, so the numbers used at the start, the very large prime numbers used at the start of the algorithm, which should be completely random and very large, um, if you can predict them in a probability which is greater than random, you greatly reduce the number of um, attacks you go for. So, for example, RSA, uh, you can go, reduce this from, for example, 256 down to, say, 56 
bytes of security and that can be cut with a normal machine, especially the machines that you have. So this was just one thing that really, this is why this protocol here has um, really gained traction here. But that attack there showed how important it was so you didn't know how the numbers were generated. Uh, again, this attack's very similar. So Bitcoin address is, well, like I say, anything between 26 and 35 alphanumeric characters. It looks completely random. But this is the destination address of a payment. So every time you send me a payment, you basically send it in my public key. Now, the idea then is if I want to send that payment, I've got to sign the transaction with my private key because then that shows I have authorization, if you like, and it's correctly mine. Otherwise, you could have everybody send, uh, spend in everybody else's. Now, there's three formats used, which is quite annoying, but uh, there's three formats, basically, and there they are there. The only real difference here is how they're generated and slight formatting things. The, like I say, the Bitcoin, though, is just a 160-bit hash of this, but these are the three different protocols, and they're all accepted on the network. Um, just fine, you just normally have to say um, what network, which, which um, wallet you're using. So this is just a very nice diagram here, just explaining how you go from basic elliptical curve into a into a Bitcoin address. Now it's quite detailed. Um, you don't really need to know much. Basically, though, all you need to know here is the public key generates the address. So once the, the, there is a direct link here between the address and the public key. Now, obviously, you do some math to it. For example, the 20, you take 20 bytes and you, you do a uh, hashing algorithm there of a SHA-256 to wipe. 160, but basically, this is what I want to show though, is the public key of this is directly linked to the, the address. So once you know the address, you know the public key, but the private key is never used in the generation at all. So, like I say, it's computationally expensive. So two, three seconds on a key generation, not uncommon. Now, this attack was on an exchange. The exchange in question um, wanted to reduce their costs. Three seconds, a lot. If you're running now, for example, this exchange 30 million users, for example, like, and every time that user wants to send a transaction, they need it to cost you three seconds of CPU power. If you're renting this on Amazon AWS or something, that's expensive. So they wanted to reduce their cost. Now, the current challenges of, of public-private key, and it's always been the case, is the wallet. Now, this is where the attacks have come in uh, with the major exchanges. They have a hot and cold wallet, cold wallets offline, hot wallets online. If you can steal the private key, you can send all the money. There's no way you can't do that. So once you've got the, the private key, you can send any funds you want, and you don't need to know, for example, where those funds are kept or anything like that because of the blockchain. The blockchain is the underlying technology of Bitcoin. It's a distributed public ledger, and this public ledger now is available to every node. You can download it. It's about 180 gig at the moment, and this contains every single transaction ever made on Bitcoin. It also contains all the wallets, it contains all the addresses, it contains all the amounts. This is Bitcoin, basically, the blockchain. And anybody can download it. So we, we generate here the, the uh, way to generate the private keys based on a predicted source. So if I know how, what sort of, how these sort of uh, keys are sourced, what, what, what inputs started these key generation, I'll show, for example, now I can get the private key very quickly. So we did this in stages. Our first uh, our first idea was basically, right, people probably put in DAF words, date of births, hello, addresses, postcodes, uh, you name it, passwords. So what we did here is basically, we took, uh, we, well, we took a rainbow list, basically, of all the, all the passwords. So we just used um, a very good rainbow list, it's only 8 gig in size, uh, and then we just did SHA-256, multiple versions of how we did SHA-256, for example, on this rainbow list. And then we search the entire database. So the script we have here, and I'll show it to you guys uh, now. So this script, if you can see it, uh, hang on. How do I show it? Uh, two secs. So this, sh this script right here is just a simple, very simple Python script. And it generates uh, nothing more than key pairs. Now, this was originally designed for uh, if you look, it just uh, just generation here of uh, public-private keys. So the idea originally here 
if you just look at the, um, for example, the, all the things by here, this generates with a random private key, perfect private key, it will generate the corresponding public key. So it takes an input and you end up with a lovely key pair. Now this is secure, this is how Bitcoin works. Um, there's a various um, methods, for example, in the basic uh, base 56 encoding, we have the um, the uh, elliptical curve encryption on this as well, and the RIPE 160 as well. So these are very standard, very, very standard. And because this Bitcoin is open source, so anybody can write this. Uh, and basically, this by here goes step by step on generation of keys. So what we did, we went backwards. So we took the private key as a source, we generated then the private key, what we thought would be a private key, and this private key would be a seed, seed source, and the seed source, rather than a very large prime number, which should be completely random, we generated this from SHA-256 in uh, many, many um, passwords, usernames, etc. And then we run it backwards. So once we have the private key, you can ge you generate the public key for this, and then we generate the Bitcoin, the related Bitcoin address. So if we go right to the bottom, it works. We end up with all all different formats here of the addresses and everything. Now this script took what, 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes to write. Most of this is open source and it's not very technical at all. But from here, we could generate the, we can generate now public private keys, but public keys, sorry, and addresses based on a known, what we think is a private key. So how we, how we saw it this. So if I just go off this a second to the, thing. Like I say, we started, for example, SHA-256, hello, we did this um, 65,000 times, and this gave us an address. So what we see in here is, when we put this through the algorithm, we were coming up with addresses. Now these addresses were live addresses. So what we had, we had the source of the uh, input into the, into the algorithm there, and I now know your address and your public key. Now the public key matched, the address matched, I also then had the private key. Now, if you look at this, this is obviously quite low tech. This is just hello. This is, and the, most of these, in fairness, were the early days of Bitcoin when it didn't really um, have much value, if you like. Like I say, we, we found them up to about 2016, and there was only 46 addresses using this sort of method. Um, when live, however, there was a lot of value in them. Uh, 1,000 Bitcoins, Bitcoin's value is $7,000 a coin at the moment. Seven, eight thousand dollars a coin, quite down on twenty thousand when it was when I did this. But like I say, in twenty seven and twenty eighteen, this sort of attack hasn't been done. But it gives us an idea. Now, what else would be useful as an input? So we thought, because Bitcoin is a public ledger, um, we can, everybody can see this. It would be very easy, for example, the Bitcoin addresses in previous or the hashes of previous uh, algorithms within the thing, the previous blocks. Now these are very random, they look very random and they are very, a very good source of input, if you like, of uh, an address. Because this is completely random, because it's public, you can easily retrieve them at a later date. So the, the idea here is, this is now a public record that everybody has. If you know where the address you started this network is from, if you ever lost your private keys, because you hear about these stories all the time where somebody loses a hard drive and they end up losing um, a hell of a lot of Bitcoin, for example, you'll be able to regenerate the, pi the private key. And that's pretty random. However, because of the, it's only a couple of million addresses in Bitcoin, about 15 million addresses at the moment, it doesn't actually take that long to go through the entire list. So what we did, we took the, we took a private key. We took an address away. And then we managed to generate the private key from it. Now all we did here was we put this address, directly into the uh, Bitcoin algorithm that we did, and it generated the private key. Now, it was nothing major, like I say, we just generated, these are all bytes of the data, and we can validate, and this is just how we validate in the claim that this sent this, this talk to this address, and what have you. So, we go back to the code, uh, just cancel out of this. There you go, that's how long it takes for that thing to um, basically generate the keys. So what was that? Under a second. We took the input there of the address and out, uh, out it spits there the uh, private key, for example, and the data. Now, because Bitcoin was public, and it is public, that's just the nature of the way it is, we then passed the entire blockchain. So the blockchain is encoded. It is not easy, for example, to read. 
But what we did, we took an address, for example, and we got this thing. So the same method here on how we did the address, we're just going backwards through the standard, back through the standard protocols. We took the entire Bitcoin blockchain, passed it into a way which we could read every single transaction. Now that was actually took me the longest time because like I say, it's 180 gig, and it took me three days to download the actual blockchain. But then I had every single address in clear text. That algorithm made us a second, for example, with key a second. Just looped it through into a CSV file, and we just set up an alert. So every time we entered a, an address, and out come the public key of another address, for example, then we know we had a match. Uh, this is just going on to just say in there how we confirmed it. Like I say, the key things here, though, if I just go back and just talk about the actual algorithm. So we verified the claim. We took an, another random address. We did a SHA-256 of the address. And that gives us a very random looking number. And this is just, like I say, this is just following Bitcoin's um, key generation protocol. We have to concatenate, for example, the for, uh, byte on the front, the 8-0. Uh, and this is just for example, this is just though for a particular type of uh, key generation pair. Then we just did a uh, double sh tar SHA-256 on this. And we did some base 64 encoding, uh, ba base uh, 58 encoding, sorry, to finalize this. And then we ended up with a key. So what we've done here is by taking an address, we ended up with a key. And this key then we can very easily, we can very easily check that this key is the same as the public key because we know what the public key of this address is. It's a public key. So by being able to generate the private key, we got the public key, the private key. So what we can do now with this data is send Bitcoin. So for a random address, I now have the private key. And it's very simple now for me to sign a transaction and empty that wallet. So this is just one off. So was it one off? No, not at all. So like I say we downloaded the entire blockchain. We had to decode the blockchain because of the way it's encoded. And we scripted this method, like I say, to check, um, to check what was in them, just to, just to check the transactions. We did this every time. Now, there's over a thousand of these compromised addresses. Now, I did this work, um, this would be around October time. So, Bitcoin at the time was worth a lot of money, about $14,000 a coin. Now, many of these still had a lot of Bitcoin in them. Uh, the actual amount, Oh, by the way, that's the day's value is $2.5, uh, $2 million. Now, at the time, that's probably worth about 6 or $7 million. Um, they, we had the keys to them all. So, basically, at the time, we could spend you know, $2 million on whatever we wanted. Now, we didn't, but we could have. But um, what we then did, we scripted the attack. So, every time, for example, any sort of we already now, we had now had the, the entire list of public private keys based on the addresses. We had a massive list of addresses, a public private key based on, um, basic passwords, names, addresses, that sort of thing. So we just set up an alert system. Every time a Bitcoin transaction with a public key come onto the network and, um, it matched what was in our database, we flagged it. And like I say, I rechecked, I rechecked all this very recently and it's still happening today. Now, this by here, this attack come about, because if I go back, the key generation is very expensive. Let's say three seconds. Now, the exchange, this was a cryptocurrency exchange system. And they told me afterwards, they did this because it was cheaper. That's all it was. It was cheaper to generate the keys this way than it was to uh, generate them the proper way. And do you know what this then? They were like, oh, nobody would ever figure out the pattern. And since then, we've put this, the same algorithm to work because a lot of the currencies you see at the moment are just spin-offs of Bitcoin or various other ways, but they tend to keep the same uh, key generation. They don't tend to mess about with that very much at all because cryptographers don't normally get involved in, in cryptocurrencies, even though there's a very strong link there. So we checked this against, for example, Dogecoin, Litecoin, all the other popular coins, and the same thing holds, is there are key generation issues, and you can use this attack on any other cryptocurrency, if you like. Ethereum as well is vulnerable to this. Now, the lesson learned here is key generation, how to generate public-private key is very important. There's no shortcuts. Now, the solution is hardware wallets. Now, these are wallets that you keep on you, 
uh, the hardware, they never connected the internet. The idea then is they store your private key very securely. And once you generate it once, you shouldn't need to generate it again. But we show in a bit that this is not strictly true. So like I say, the impact of this is, well, you don't use inputs. You, you, you take seriously public-private key crypto. You generate your own keys. You don't rely on somebody else to do it for you. And you do use a offline wallet as well, not an exchange. But again, this comes in a, a risk. So you, for example, you print out your private key. You don't keep it on your server. You keep it, you keep it a printed copy in a fireproof box, something like that. You don't rely on hardware, you don't rely on anything to generate. So you've got to be responsible for the generations of public keys that yourself. And this is the most critical thing. And this is what a lot of people don't understand is they trust in third party exchanges, for example, to do this. But the whole point of Bitcoin was never, you don't trust third parties at all. It was decentralized and everybody was responsible for itself. So this is, people's got sloppy basically. Now, the Nano Ledger, we, we, we go talk about two things here. Um, one of the attacks is great. It got me by surprise, but it got me thinking. Nano Ledger is a very popular wallet. You can pick it up for about 40 pounds, so about $60. And like, that's what they call it. They, it's just a way to store Bitcoin and other coins securely on your thing. Problem is, the key generation here generates on a seed value. These seed values are 24 uh, random words. Sounds familiar, don't it? You generate them based on random, random numbers, but it sounds familiar. This is going back to the same way we were doing just before. So what we actually thought was, there's only so many words are hard-coded into this wallet. There's not many words at all. What the attack was, basically, we'd uh, purchase a second-hand one off eBay. Now this would have somebody's, uh, they, somebody's used this and stored Bitcoins in there. And we can generate the seed value. So if we can calculate, there's only 24 uh, words and there's not many combinations. There's under a hundred different combinations here. So we're not talking about a large number here at all. Now this this could be very easily cracked in on, on a machine and in fact it was. Once we figure out the key the seed generation, we'd be able to generate all keys based on that seed because the seed is the most important thing. And once we generate the seed, the, the um, keys, well we profit. We just um, use them to spend the guys' bitcoins. Now. First, uh, well, we, well, we bought one on eBay. But the problem is the seller shipped it with the original key generations in the box. So he made my life a lot easier. A very lot. It made my life a lot easier. I just put them in. Now that made my attack very, very quick. So the guy then had quite a lot of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then we had to tell him, obviously. Uh, but it was way too easy. The problem is we bought seven of them. Now, four, uh, four users then sent them with the original stuff still in the box. Now, this goes back to my early days in, with hard drive. I've done a lot of um, computer forensics in my time, especially with uh, the master's level. Um, when people were buying hard drives off eBay and then taking their credit card details because they're not realizing what they're actually sending. And we're now in a stage again where basically people now need to be educated in the risks now of sending, for example, seed values with the item. So while they think they've been very helpful by sending everything original that was with the box, they don't actually realize that what they've just gone and sent to me is gold. Is gold. It's better than the £40 I spent on the, um, on the uh, wallet. So I'm just going to go on to something in a bit here. This is going off topic a bit, very off topic actually on public private key, but it's a pretty cool attack I did. But um, if I just go back to the Nano Ledger, so let's say this was an easy, an easy attack here. But the other attack we did, we took every single possible combination of, um, of words, and they were set words. And what we found as well was, while we could generate every single possible combination of these words, uh, there, was t there tend to be a pattern. So we can now go back to where randomness is not being applied. So if you go back at the start, I said about RSA. Uh, the NSA backed all that because they can predict keys, great, they can predict the prime numbers greater than random, and then you can generate um, different keys, but you know, you, go, you can reduce, for example, um, your attack vector. How many keys you need to do, it makes life a lot easier. And this was turned to be the same. So this just goes to show that while the hardware wallet is a great thing, the implementation of how the key generation is done is quite bad. And to be honest, this is now almost as bad to me, if you ever sell one second hand, it's very bad. 
However, if you keep them online and use them properly, they're great. So it's just showing the risks now evolved, now evolving with uh, wallets and this sort of technology. So like I, said, I was going off topic a bit, but this is a 51% attack. 51% attack on Bitcoin has uh, made quite a bit of news recently um, because it's happened, for example, on Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, um, a lot of major networks as well. Basically, what the 51% attack is, I need 51% of computing power on Bitcoin to control it. Now, now researchers have shown, for example, it take, you can get this down to 22% using uh, malicious mining and uh, mining pools and this sort of thing. Problem is, that's, that's still a large number because when the top 500 supercomputers is less than 1% of Bitcoin, that's a massive number and it's very expensive. Now, 30 Raspberry Pis, though, is a lot more cheaper and I have that in my house, so um, I had an idea. Bitcoin's not decentralized at all. Uh, it likes to say it is, but it's not. Um, we've done research, for example, now that shows um, the, there is no nodes in Africa at all currently running a full blockchain because of the sheer cost of it. There's no miners um, in certain countries because of the energy costs, and it's very centralized. Now, 30 developers also control Bitcoin. Now, they've hard-coded in um, six DNS nodes. Now, these DNS nodes are great. Um, whenever you join the network, you query the DNS nodes, and they give you back a bunch of IP addresses. Now, these IP addresses then are Bitcoin nodes, and you communicate with these then to get the entire blockchain. So the, 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 um, the lack of um, decentralization here with these six nodes can be exploited. So I call this a DNS poison attack. Basically, these six DNS nodes will always give you back 20 nodes. So every time you query them, uh, this has since been changed, but every time you query them, you've got 20 nodes back. Now, the problem is, they, didn't act, they weren't actually very clever. So every time you sent them a request, these DNS nodes would send back the 20 most recently seen nodes on the network. So the idea here was, obviously, I've just seen this node, I know it's online, if I give it to you, here is a node that is gonna be online. Like, the logic is good. Problem is, now that's very easy to fake. If I spam this, if what we were doing, we were spamming these DNS nodes with these 30 nodes, being like, hello, I'm online, can I have some stuff, can I have some blocks, can I have some transactions, this sort of thing, and we're just constantly looping this around. So it's almost like a denial of service attack, but without actually taking out the DNS node. Now, the problem is, this, this node, every node then that queried um, this uh, DNS node, ended up with our nodes. So, because it only gives 20 nodes back, if we, did, we had 30 nodes, and we did it to all six at the same time, a node joining the network then would end up with our nodes. Now, Bitcoin has a blockchain. This blockchain, for example, is a cryptographically linked um, set of data from day one, from Genesis. Now, you can't alter this, but it doesn't mean you can't fork it. So you can split the blockchain in, in half, basically. So while the, net, while the Honest Network is working on the uh, blockchain over the here, because this... Because of the new nodes joining this network doesn't know of any other blockchain at all, as far as that node is concerned, whatever node or data it gets from our nodes is honest. They doesn't, they're not aware of any others because the only way um, nodes know about other nodes on the network is through this DNS protocol. We can then force them to have a different uh, opinion. So what we did is we, forked, we did this live on the Bitcoin network. And over time, what we found as well is the uh, Bitcoin nodes drop off the network very quickly. Like they, they normally tend to drop off within a day and then come back online, that sort of thing. But you tend to see a quite a large network churn. So it would be very possible that over a period of time, and it would need a large, it would need a large uh, period of time for this, we would generally be able to force new nodes onto our network. Now this network we control, and if we knew that a node was on our network, we could send out a transaction. Now, they would accept that transaction as being honest. Uh, for example, if I paid Bob $50, this node on this network would believe that's true. Problem, and then if you know that node communicated with another exchange, for example, or whatever, they would then ship the package off. But on the real Bitcoin network, that transaction would never exist. So what I've managed to do there is spend Bitcoin, uh, I don't, uh, I haven't really spent, and I've still got an item for it. Now, this was, the attack, for example, on Bitcoin Gold has cost about 200000 an hour. Um, this entire attack cost less than £600, so under $1,000. So it's a lot cheaper. And mind you, it does take a lot longer, but the results are the same. 
So this is just a summary here of the attacks. You create 30 nodes, you just spam the DNS with it, and when a new node joins, you, you only, the only visibility is yours. So only I see, only, I, only the nodes see what I decide they can see. Uh, if the nodes don't, if, uh, if I don't decide the nodes don't see a transaction, they don't see them. And because these nodes are not aware of the other nodes on the network, uh, they don't know any difference. And as, the net, as more and more new nodes join, which we see with the popularity, for example, of Bitcoin increasing, uh, we have a bigger, larger network. It looks more honest. We then have mining power. Now, there could be a stage, I wouldn't say this is likely, but theoretically it would be a stage where over a period of time we'd have more hashing power than Bitcoin. Um, this would obviously take years to do, but if we ended up with a stage where 51% of the mining power was on our partition of the network and Bitcoin, we could then eclipse Bitcoin itself, deleting all of the history on Bitcoin and then making our transactions live. Now, obviously, that is very, that's a very probability, um, very low probability attack and success rate on that. It's likely as we detected before then, but it could happen. And the theory here is showing that it can happen. It's just if it actually would, we don't know. So the attack on this, uh, the defense on this is quite simple. Like I say, my background's in Tor, and I like Tor quite a bit. I don't quite believe in what they do anymore, especially with the research we found. Um, for example, we found out 95% of what's actually hosted on Tor is not drugs, and that is child abuse, um, which is terrible. So since then, we've gone from securing Tor to attacking it. But if, we, if there was a system, rather than DNS nodes, which is giving out 20 nodes, if we could then give out a consensus document saying every single node on this network, here it is in the massive list, this is how long it's been online for, this is the address of it. Now, this doesn't... This doesn't actually reduce the anonymity of Bitcoin in any way, in any way shape, or form, because it's very easy for us to crawl the entire Bitcoin network. But this would then give every single node at start a very public um, address, if you like, a very public view of the network. And then there'll be no, and also then this reduces decentralization. Because if we said, yes, we know where every node is, but every single node on the network also has the same document, all up to date. There's no, 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 there's no need for these six DNS nodes. So it decentralizes it quite a way as well. It reduces load on the network. And it actually, with having... Um, so I've taken this as well in my, uh, in my cryptocurrency that we're launching. We've, we've done, basically, defend this, this attack. We've launched this same thing. And one of the benefits on this is by having a global view, you can reduce network load. So rather than now spamming the entire network with a gossip protocol, as is the case with Bitcoin, where every node you gets a transaction, they send it to every node it knows, and you end up with the same transaction about 500 times, which is quite annoying. Um, you could use this sort of um, centralization, uh, not centralization, but this sort of consensus document here to really streamline the uh, bandwidth and the actual streamline of transactions. So you, you reduce the latency of transactions here um, while also securing it up as well. So, like I say, this, this talk wasn't going to be the whole hour. It's about 40 minutes, so coming to the end of it now. But, um, yeah, do you have any questions? Uh, and if not, thank you guys for listening. Thanks. Yep. We, we can't say. I, I can't say I'm under a hell of an NDA on this. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's, it's a TO1 exchange. So it was, a, it was a major exchange with many million users. So there's not many of them around. Yeah? Uh, is your research going to be published in some way? Uh, yes, yeah. These have since all the attacks here have been in academic journals and. Um, most of this has been published as part of my PhD as well. So um, if you look online, um, these have been peer-reviewed before they even went out to this sort of talk. Uh, and yeah, they're all online. Cool. All right, cheers, guys. <laughs>